okay the next unit we have is the in fact the last sub unit we have is the internal order charter internal order charter what it is we will need to know uh, I'm telling you again and again that you do not need to memorize the standard numbers you do not need to memorize any standard number you just need to know what they are the emphasis is on understanding concepts not on memorization okay so uh, I have broken down this definition of purpose authority and responsibility into sub components so uh, uh, as we have already agreed that internal audit department works as an independent and objective assurance and consulting activity I'm sure in the three domains that is the definition of internal auditing controls risk management and governance processes we need to have a formal authority the proper uh, scope of our actions so there must be some specific terms of our engagement of our work there could be confusion because if internal audit work is not specifically designed then the, the internal orders might be dragged from one end to the other CEO might be pushing uh, audit executive in one direction the board of directors on the other so it is always recommended that there should be a written formal document that defines what internal audit activity is what it is purpose what is authority <coughs> what it is responsibility so what we're going to read about a very important document which you call the internal audit charter it's a formal document internal audit charter basically is a formal document basically I have broken down this definition to small components so I can explain them in detail so internal audit charter is a document that defines the internal audit department's purpose what is the purpose of internal audit department what is the authority of the internal audit department and what is the responsibility clearly defined purpose authority and responsibility this document gives you a position in the organization where do you stand to whom do you report so this document establishes the internal audit activities position within the organization it empowers you it gives you authorization because during the work you have to access various records physical installations people so this document empowers you gives you the power to access records people personnel and physical properties relevant to the performance of your engagements mean you should have the authority to access records people and physical properties which are needed for the purpose of the job <coughs> And since internal audit department cannot do everything, then what it can do, there must be some specific limits what internal audit department can do. It is defined in the scope of internal auditing within the internal audit charter that what the internal audit department can do. So uh, I'm going to show you a sample charter. This charter has been given by the Institute of Internal Audit Auditors, Model Internal Audit Activity Charter authority what is the authority of the internal audit department has been given here organization who would be heading the department what would be the plan of action independence and objectivity uh, what is the responsibility of the internal audit department all this has to be clearly laid down how the internal audit will be executed who would receive the internal audit reportings reporting and monitoring a written report will be prepared and issued by the chief audit executive will be submitted to the board and etc etc so all must be clearly laid down in this charter once this charter is drawn up approved this day of blah blah and remember it is approved by the chief audit executive signed by chief audit executive and approved by the chairman and chief executive officer now this is very important for you people to understand in the previous lectures I told you that the chief audit executive the head of internal audit department or the director of internal auditing has a dual responsibilities it reports administratively administratively don't forget that administratively to the chief executive officer and chief audit executive reports functionally we will read about that in the coming lectures to the audit committee of the board of directors or the chairman of the board it means the chief or executive has dual responsibilities dual reporting lines administrative reporting day-to-day -day reporting remember administrative means day-to-day -day. a 
procurement, marketing, research, internal audit, I mean uh, controls, inventory, <coughs> receivables, payables, day-to-day -day operations, these reportings are directed to the chief executive officer, whereas the functional reporting on the internal controls, on the uh, governance processes, risk management, this is done to the audit committee, chairman of the board. We will read about that in detail in our coming lectures. So we got very clear understanding that the internal audit charter is a formal document drafted to define what the internal audit purpose, authority and responsibilities are, what the work they can take, what is their scope, what are the records, people and physical properties they can access and what is their position within the internal audit department. So that's very important. So internal audit charter is a must because if, if there is any, any confusion, any conflict be, uh, between the management and the board, I mean the audit committee and the chief executive officer, then this internal audit charter can remove ambiguities and doubts. So the importance of formal charter cannot be overstated. I mean it is very important. This following paragraph will explain <coughs> why is it important. Since I'm telling you again and again and again and again then you do not need to memorize any number. Just you need to have an idea what the standards tell you and apply those according to the MCQs. Do not learn these numbers. So I've broken down this interpretation standard into smaller components so that you can make a fuller understanding. So what this standard 1000, we don't care about 1000, what the standards tell us about the internal audit charter. We need to know it in detail so that we can make a better understanding. First of all, this internal audit charter, we have agreed it defines why the internal audit department exists, what it is authority, what it is responsibility. So it defines our purpose, authority and responsibility. Second, we have read in detail that the internal audit charter defines where are we located in the, within the inter, uh, depart, uh, in, in the company, within the in organizational chart, where do we stand, to whom do we report. Normally, our dual reporting, functional reporting is to the audit committee or the chairman of the board and administrative reporting is to chief executive officer. It has to be clearly specified within the charter. So our position within the company must be clearly defined. Again, then we, I told you again, we have dual responsibilities, dual reporting. So it must be defined what is our relationship to the board and the chief, exec, chief audit executive. Define the nature of chief audit executive functional reporting relationship with the board. That I am repeatedly telling you that we perform functional reporting for the audit committee and the board and administrative reporting on day-to-day -day operations to the chief executive officer. This internal audit charter, as we have already agreed, that it authorizes and gives powers to the internal auditors to access certain records, people and physical properties related to the work we do. So we should have access to records, personnel and physical properties relevant to our job as internal auditors. And again, we know that the scope, what we can and we cannot do, it must be specified within the internal audit charter, the scope, the work that we can and we cannot do. And since I tell you, we, we draft, this internal audit charter is drafted by the chief audit executive and his team. And its final approval is given by the chairman of the board or the audit committee and the chief executive officer. So if they want to make any addition or want to delete, it is their uh, prerogative. So they will let you know and then you will redraft it and submit it for approval. So don't think that the board is so uh, free that they will draft the internal order charter for you or the chief executive officer will do. You will draft it yourself and then board will and the chief executive officer will add and delete something to make it acceptable to them. So the final approval of the internal order charter resides with the board of directors. So we understand this implementation standard 1000. Next, we as internal auditor perform various works which can be categorized into two main domains, assurance and consultation. When you provide assurance, we are in fact providing audit services and in consulting service, we provide advice. So the department process facility division whom we are auditing, it's called audity. We are the auditor and those who we audit is called the audity. So an auditee must not be able, so the auditee like I am auditing the purchasing department. 
The purchasing department is auditee and I am the auditor. The purchasing department cannot restrict my work. The auditee cannot and must not stop me from doing my work. He must not refuse. He must not refuse my access to records, people and physical properties. If he does, that's a very serious uh, scope limitation that must immediately be reported to the board. So, auditee has no power to limit my work or to restrict or refuse access to records, people and physical properties. So, in order to avoid such confusion and misunderstanding, the clients, the auditees, they must be informed. They should know that what is our purpose, what is our authority and responsibility, what is our scope of work. So, they will know what we what we have and what are the authorities given to us. So this will prevent any misunderstanding and this will pre pre prevent any confusions between the auditee and us. <coughs> All right, so that makes sense. So here we have a, a little MCQ for understanding. A charter is one of the more important factors positively affecting the internal audit activities independence which of the following is least likely to be a part of charter we will include certain things what is least likely to be the part of charter access to records within the organization yes it would be included and it should be included yes it must be the scope of internal audit activity yes that what we can cannot do d the access to personnel within this this is we have just read that we should have access to records, people and scope. But what would be the duration of the chief audit executive? This is absolutely rubbish. We don't include this. The length of tenure of the chief audit executive means how, for how many years have the chief audit executive been appointed. That is nothing to be included in the internal audit charter. Then where would this be included? The length of tenure of the chief audit executive would be in the employment contract for how long has he been appointed. So it's nothing to do with the internal audit charter. So something that is odd is C and that is why it's the correct answer because he was looking for something that is least likely. So length of tenure of chief audit executive is not likely to be included in the charter but A, B and D would be included in the charter. It makes sense perfectly. All right, moving on. I am telling you again and again that you do not need to memorize any number, 1001, 1002, how many numbers will you memorize? So the simple way, I, I normally, sometimes I recommend that students should straight away go for the questions. But uh, for those who do not have the theoretical knowledge, find it hard. So uh, what I recommend to all CIEA students that you should spend 10% of your time on reading the theory and 90% and 95% time should be spent on doing the questions. That will give you much more understanding than the theory can ever give you. So, there is a practice advisory 1001. We don't need to remember what it, the number is, but what it says that should be kept in mind, not need to be memorized. So, this advisory standard gives some key points that you need to remember. One, internal audit charter, it's all about internal audit charter. Internal audit charter. <coughs> provide a formal Bakaida written internal audit charter it is critical for managing the internal audit activity it is crucial because if there is no internal audit charter there will always be ambiguity confusion that what internal auditors can do what they cannot do if it is brought down in writing likha pada ho jana, black and white mein things when the things are in black and white it uh, then it, it becomes uh, easily understandable for the parties who are in a conflict so it is crucial and critical that the written formal internal audit charter should exist for the internal audit department. Because this internal audit charter, which is accepted and approved by the board of directors, gives inter the internal audit department the power and authority that is needed to do their work. So it says that the internal audit charter provides a recognized statement of review and acceptance by management and approval as a document in the minutes by the board. Means the internal audit charter is a recognized statement that these are the powers, purpose, authority and responsibility of the internal audit department. 
So, internal audit charter provides a recognized statement for review and acceptance by management and for approval as documents in the minutes by the board. Minutes, uh, uh, you people I am sure remember those who are involved in a little bit of corporate uh, affairs of the company. Whenever meetings takes place between the senior management board of directors, what is discussed is kept in minutes, they are called the mi minutes of the meetings. So, that is what he is talking about, documents in the minutes of the board by the board. So, when the meeting are taking place between the senior management and the board, the issues that are discussed are recorded in minutes. So, as to uh, bring in recording that what was discussed during what meeting. And then it also facilitates a periodic assessment of adequacy. See, things are randomly and repeatedly changing. So, the internal audit charter we drafted uh, maybe three or four years ago may have become totally outdated and irrelevant to the changed circumstances. So, we may have to bring new things and regularly assess their adequacy and completeness so that we can accommodate new changed situations into the internal audit charter. That is what tells it also facilitates periodic assessment of the adequacy of internal audit activities, purpose, authority, responsibility. So, if there are changed circumstances, the periodic assessment or review of the internal audit charter can help you to bring changes that might be needed in the fast changing environment in which we are operating. And again, uh, uh, internal audit, uh, uh, internal auditors and head of internal audit, a powerful entity within the company. There is again a conflict, but sometimes because we have dual responsibility, we report functionally to the audit committee and administratively the chief executive officer. So there might be a conflict because sometime we are operating under two bosses, so there could exist a conflict. One might uh, try to impose a restriction that might contravene the relationship with the other. So, in this situation, again, internal order charter will help you. If any question arises of conflict, internal order charter provides a formal written agreement with the management of the board that what my role is, what my powers and authority is. So, that is why it is very crucial. Internal order charter helps to, con to remove any ambiguity, any conflict between the senior management and various executives in the company. So, now let us read something about the chief audit executive responsibility for periodic assessment. As I told you, chief audit executive will draft the internal audit charter and this charter would be submitted to the management and the chief executive officer, I mean the audit committee and the chief executive officer for approval. So, chief executive officer is responsible for periodically assessing that whether the internal audit activity purpose, authority and responsibility is still adequate because things are changing r r fastly in, in, a, in quick fashion. So, we have to regularly assess as a chief audit executive that whether the purpose, authority and responsibility that was originally given after before 5 years, is it still adequate to meet my objectives? And if there is a there is a gap, I mean if the internal audit charter is not giving the full coverage, then we must as a chief audit executive, I must report it to the management and the board that the powers, authority, <coughs> purpose and responsibility is inadequate. And as described in the following, standards which I told, the, 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 we use simply the word standards now, there are three types of standards, performance standard, attribute standard and then implementation that standard that ex explain and further elaborate the performance and attribute standards. We do not need to remember any standard number or standard title, we need to know what they are simply. So, as described in the following standard, the charter itself must refer to the mandatory guidance. The charter should not contain anything that contravenes with the standards of internal auditing issued by the Institute of Internal Audit. That is very crucial because if you have drafted an uh, internal audit charter that contravenes with the, with the basic mandatory guidance, then, then that charter is not acceptable. I mean that will violate the, uh, the code and, and violate the standard of the Institute of Internal Auditors. So, the standard that we, the charter that we draw up must be in accordance with the mandatory guidance. Let us read it. Again, we have attribute standard 1010. We do not need to remember the number. What this tells you have been broken down into smaller parts. We know that everything we are studying is based upon the definition of internal. That is the foundation. I am sure you remember the figure I showed. 
I uh, explained it about a couple of days ago. The internal auditing definition is the foundation of your mandatory guidance. Then we have the code of ethics and then the standards. Your internal audit charter must, must not violate these three. Internal audit charter must not violate internal auditing definition, it must not violate code of ethics and it must not violate standards. <coughs> In other words, all these three the definition of internal auditing, code of ethics and standards must be recognized in the internal audit charter. Charter should not go against these three. All right, so when the chief audit executive drafts the internal audit charter, senior management doesn't know these standards, doesn't know the code of ethics. So we as a, I as a chief audit executive, I need to discuss this definition, the code and the standards with the management and the board so that we can come up with the standard or uh, we can come up with the with the charter that is in accordance with the definition of internal auditing in accordance with the code of ethics in accordance with standards let me give you an example uh, in a company the chief audit executive is being asked to report functionally to the ch chief financial officer for example just an example as an internal auditor head chief audit executive if I am being asked to report functionally to the CFO, then this totally is against the definition of internal auditing. I will not be independent. Why? Because I am reporting to CFO who is a depart departmental head of finance activity. So in such a situation when the contravention of internal audit definition occurs, then that charter actually is, is in violation of the definition. That is why the charter must comply with the definition of internal auditing with the code of ethics and the standards and the chief audit executive must discuss this with the board so that the internal audit charter drafted must be in accordance with these. Now let us do some key definitions now and I am telling you again and again and again you need to understand more not memorization. What you need to memorize only those four principles of code of ethics. The definitions do not need to be memorized, but they are useful to the exam for candidates and practitioners. Now let us read the basics of what the chief audit executive would be. What is his role responsibility? The chief audit executive sometimes called the director internal auditing, the head of internal audit department or whatever name given. He is the person in a senior position in fact who heads the internal audit department. Basically, he has the whole responsibility for effectively managing the internal audit activity. The person who is heading the internal audit department is called the chief audit executive and he is responsible for the whole internal audit department. He must conduct his work in accordance with the internal audit charter, in accordance with the definition of internal auditing and in accordance with the code of ethics and in accordance with the standards. So it means internal audit head or the director of internal auditing or the chief audit executive, his work should be done within these four domains in accordance with four domains. The charter which itself is drawn from the definition of internal auditing, the ethics and the standards. So our work should be within the boundary. That's <coughs> Then next we have the staff auditor, see the chief audit executive is the one who is heading the internal audit department. There will be some people working under him, the manager audit, the internal auditors, staff auditors, assistant auditors, there are many designations. And again these definitions need not to be memorized, they just are helpful for you to understand the idea, the concepts. Chief audit executive or other reporting to the chief audit executive will have appropriate professional. See, I am working as an as a internal auditor. I report to the chief audit executive. Chief audit executive himself will be a qualified accountant holding ACCA, CA or CIA. But the people working under him are expected to have appropriate professional certifications like CMA, CIA, CA, CS, CSA, etc. So these qualifications make you more competent, more proficient in your work.
and as I told you that the chief audit executive, uh, the word this is frequently used in the US, but we in Pakistan use the word the head of internal audit department. I was the head of internal audit department in a listed company. So we use the word head of internal audit department. In some countries we use the director auditing or director internal audit or internal audit director. So whatever <coughs> the specific title is given to the job, the chief audit executive means head of internal audit, director internal auditing or whatever term. The person who is responsible for the overall internal audit activity in the company is the head or the chief audit executive. So that ends your uh, unit 1 completely. You can now go online and do all the questions. So unit 1 is totally complete.